Okay, we talked a little bit about dimensions and units, but how might we use them to better understand an equation? And in particular, how can we extract some dimensionless ratios out of an equation that we already know to see which terms in the equation might be big or small and think about different regimes of behavior. In general, there's an idea called dynamic similitude, which means that if you have an equation, and all of the dimensionless ratios that appear in that equation are the same, and you get the same kind of behavior out of that equation, even if it's on a tiny, tiny scale or a big, big scale, it's not the scale itself that matters, it's the dimensionless ratios within it. So you can make a scale model, say, of a boat, matching all of the important dynamical parameters, dimensionless ratios that are dynamical parameters, and if those match to a full-size boat, you'd expect to actually get the same behavior in a little tank, a little boat in a tank, as a big boat in the ocean. That's the kind of thing we can use to um, generalize equations from one form to another. Dimensionless equations are also really important for numerical simulations where we might not actually be using the numbers that are the same numbers as the real world, but we're using ones where all of the dynamical parameters are matched. Dimensionless ratios, that's dynamical parameter ratios are matched. And that's something that we can think about as being matched in the appropriate way to the real world problem. Okay, but how do we get these dimensionless ratios out of an equation? This is a nice example equation. This is the X momentum equation of a rotating fluid. Um, and here, so here is the acceleration of the velocity in the X direction, which we're calling U. And then there's an invection term of U by itself. There's an invection term of U by the velocity in the other direction. And so there's a partial derivative with respect to Y, partial derivative with respect to X. And here are the, other, the two components, U and V of the velocity in those two directions. Here's the Coriolis parameter, which is in the V velocity with a particular parameter, which depends on how fast the Earth is rotating here. And then we have a pressure gradient force, which depends on the density and the pressure, the ratio of the, of the pressure to um, the X direction, which is the same direction as the velocity acceleration. So this pressure gradient force can also cause an acceleration. And then we have a viscosity a uh, viscous force with a viscosity nu, and then d by dz squared of u. Um, sometimes you might see this written with a nabla rather than a d by dz squared. Sometimes you might have a three-dimensional problem rather than a two-dimensional problem. We don't actually even have to understand where this equation comes from to start understanding the dimensionless parameters within it. Let me show you how that goes. Okay, so a velocity has the dimensions of length per unit time, and the derivative of the velocity with respect to time has the units of length per unit time squared. It's an acceleration. So we could either say this was length over time squared, or we might prefer to say that it was just a typical velocity divided by a typical time scale. Now we don't know what this velocity is going to be, but this is the velocity that has to do with the rate of change in this acceleration term this is the time that has to do with the amount of time over which we have to pay attention. So in some sense we're saying, suppose our typical velocity change over the experiment we're carrying out is u, and the typical experiment length is time t. That might be a way to scale this. Or maybe you have some other method, because maybe there's tidal forcing or something that's maybe giving you a different period that you'd like to link into the time. Um, there are lots of ways you could estimate these, but you can say, I select them from the problem at hand. There is a typical velocity scale, there's a typical time scale. That's a decent guess for how big this term is going to be. What about this term? So this term has a velocity and then an x derivative of a, a velocity. So we could say that this term is about the size of u squared over length. So again, this is the typical velocity. We don't really need to make this velocity scale any different than this one. We're not really shooting to get precision here. We just want to have a sense of the dimensions and the rough magnitude of each of these terms. So this thing is roughly like a velocity squared over a, a length scale, which is how the size of the, of the uh, interval over which the gradient is spread. And we're not really distinguishing between changes in velocity and the magnitude of velocity. 
as well by just saying the same u applies to both. You could be more precise if you wanted to, but as a rough estimate, that's not a bad idea. Now over here, we have the v velocity, the u velocity, and a y length scale. We could be specialized things and put an x length scale here and say this was u times v over the y length scale, which might be different than the x length scale, or we could just make things simple for ourselves and say that the problem is relatively isotropic. That means that the velocity and the length scale are about the same in all directions. And then we could say that that term also has the size u squared over l. This term has whatever this rotation rate of the Earth is times a velocity scale. We, this is something that we would look up for our particular latitude and rotation rate of our planet. Um, so we don't have to specify it here, we just keep track of it. Um, then density, pressure, oh, we don't know what those are gonna be. We could think that there's a typical unit, that there's a typical density value, a typical deviation in pressure, and so we might call that P. And then a length scale again, is minus sign, but the minus sign doesn't really matter. We're just getting minus signs. So this thing goes like some kind of pressure jump over uh, density and times the length scale. And then this last one goes like the viscosity times the velocity over a length scale squared. And I don't have to worry too much about the pluses and minuses. So each of these has dimensions that go basically like this. Some of them have parameters like the Coriolis parameter the density here, the viscosity here, that are not provided by this equation or solved for by this equation, but they're coming from some measurable property of the fluid at hand. That's the kind of thing that you might start thinking about. Um, and notice that all of them have to have consistent dimensions to be added together or set to equality. So u, u over t is length over time squared, u squared over l is also length squared, length over time squared, two lengths in the velocity, one of them cancels out, second one goes in the downstairs, f over u tells us the units of f are gonna be one over time scale, so that we're still length over time squared, similar here, similar here. Okay, that's cool. Now we can divide through by some convenient measure of uh, and make all of these terms dimensionless. So suppose you tell me, oh, I think U is about the size, the typical size of U for this problem, and the typical size of L for this problem are like this. I can divide through this whole equation by that. So I would multiply L times U squared times the whole thing. And what would I find? Well. I could say that this term is L times U over U squared times time. That's going to cancel a bit. And now I have L over U times time. So if this U is the U that comes from crossing the length scale L in the time T, then we might not even have this as a parameter. We might say that the L's and U's and T's here are actually links to one another um, and call this thing one. Um, you don't have to have that. Um, in an infection problem, that sort of makes sense. In a wave propagation problem, you might wanna have something like the speed of sound coming in um, in addition. So you might not wanna make that cancellation between U and C and so you might come out finding something like a Mach number here. Okay, but this one is just a simple cancellation. This one also has size one, this one also has size one. What about this one? This comes out to be F, L over U. This has no dimensions. It has the same dimensions as the number one, but it's a ratio of something times the, the length scale times the magnitude of the Coriolis parameter versus the velocity. This thing is actually called the Rossby number, or actually the inverse of the Rossby number. U over FL is the Rossby number. Rossby is a famous atmosphere and ocean dynamicist. This number is named after him because he did a lot of work on 
rotating fluid dynamics, and this is the key term in a rotating fluid dynamics problem. And when the Rossby number is big, it means that this term is not very big compared to these other terms that are all size one. When the Rossby number is small, it means that this term is maybe more important than these other terms that are size one. Similarly, for this term, you get something that goes like P over rho naught u squared. This one is called the Euler number. And for this one, we get nu times ul. This one is called the Reynolds number. Or uh, actually, it's the inverse of the Reynolds number for that one. So for a large Reynolds number flow, the viscous term is very, very small compared to the other terms in the equation. You might even neglect it. For a Euler number term that was order one, you might say that this term could possibly interact with these other order one terms. Or if the Euler number is the same size as, say, the inverse Rossby number, you can imagine a balance between this term and this term. This is all very approximate, but suppose we can say that the Reynolds number is very, very large for the problem at hand. We might just drop this term from consideration right at the beginning. That's the idea of scaling a set of equations to find out the approximate size of the different terms and then using that maybe to drop some terms. When we drop a bunch of terms, we come up with something that's called a distinguished balance, which is what we think the most important terms in the equation are. And then we might actually reintroduce those small terms as corrections in something called a perturbation theory. All of this is the first starting step to get there. Um, and you'll see, as we've talked already, that it really relies on dimensional consistency among all of the terms that you're thinking about in the original equation. and the concept of looking for dimensionless ratios. The dimensionless ratios, remember, are the things that tell us how the equation is behaving. If you have a particular Rossby number, a particular Euler number, a particular Reynolds number, it doesn't actually matter what the magnitude of L and U are, or F, or rho, or viscosity. Matching these three dimensionless parameters tells us how that equation behaves in the absence of any particular choice of units or conventions. So those three things are the things that are the key descriptor of the regime of behavior you're in.